Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Defeat Diabetes live interview with uh, with Ray Kelly. And uh, the great man is with us. G'day, Ray. Hey, Pete. How you going? Good, good. Now, what's it like to be a media superstar? <laughs> I don't know about that, but um, I tell you what is inspiring, though, is the amount of uh, people that have reached out, as you would know, with the projects you're running, that people really want help. They really want guidance. Uh, they're putting their hand up. They see if there's a, a chance you can help them. They really want that help, and, and that's fantastic. We probably should explain. I presume most of the people uh, watching will have watched the uh, Michael Mosley three-part series that uh, finished on SBS uh, last night uh, in, in Australia uh, called Australia's Health Revolution, and Ray was a big part of that that program. But uh, look, we'll come back to, to Michael Mosley and, and the show a bit later. But I, want, I like to always start by uh, by hearing people's stories. Uh, you know how how did you go from from where you started to uh, to where you are now? And uh, I have read a little bit about your story, and it's an absolutely fascinating one. So um, take us back to uh, to childhood in, uh, in Western Sydney. You're a you're a Gomeroy man. You have an Indigenous background. Um, tell us about growing up in the in the west of Sydney. Yeah, I was born in Blacktown. My family, like you mentioned, in Gomeroy region, so up uh, Wallabadar, uh, Karindai, Tamworth area. Uh, but my mum uh, and her family had moved down and um, I was born in Blacktown Hospital and grew up in Mount Druid in Lethbridge Park, good old Letho on Luxford Road. Uh, and, yeah, look, it was pretty tough in the early days. Uh, we didn't have much money and a lot, a lot of... Yeah, Christmases were always hampers. You know, we had sort of the docs coming around and checking us out, checking in on us. And um, there, yeah, there, there, there was a lot of issues at home uh, that we had to battle. And it was five kids under six years of age with two with a uh, mental disability. Uh, so, you know, it, it was tough for everyone, I guess. Uh, and my parents were just trying to find their way. But um, I sort of, yeah, I was getting in trouble from the age of eight and I only ever went to school to play footy. Like, you know, I, I really didn't care much about learning. I didn't see the big picture. And I guess I, I didn't have anyone that had finished school before. And to be honest, uh, not to get too ahead of the story, but my daughter's 15 and if she finishes a HSC, she'll be the first one ever in all of my extended family that's finished high school, including myself. So, you know, it, it, there wasn't a lot of role models in that respect. So anyway, look, I, I, my parents separated when I was uh, 11 and and we moved back up Bush. And uh, and my mum ended up meeting a great guy who uh, raised us. Uh, he was illiterate, so he couldn't read or write. He was a cowboy, a bull rider and broke in horses for a living. But he sort of really instilled in me the, the importance of education. And whilst it took a little while to sink in for me, I was still sort of running amok and getting in trouble throughout high school. Uh, later on in my early adulthood, it would really hit home. And so, as I said, I I sort of, I left school as soon as I could, which was just a week after my 16th birthday in year 10. Um, I always wanted to go to uni. I liked the idea of it. I just, I didn't know. The only people I knew that went to uni were my teachers and doctors. Like, I didn't really know anyone. So I, there was no sort of um, scaffolding or anything like that. And, and and I probably stuffed around that much that not many of my teachers would have seen much hope for me there anyway. But it was something that I really wanted to do. Uh, and I sort of run amok for a number of years and spiraled out of control, to be honest. And then sort of at the age of 21, started picking up weights in a local PCYC uh, gym, uh, working for free voluntary. So I was painting houses during the day and driving 100 Ks to work for free for a few hours at night, a few nights a week. And he paid for me to get my accreditation and... Um, then I sort of started working in Tamworth and within two years I'd moved to Sydney and within a matter of months, because I, I started reading, you might know of Tudor Bomper. Tudor Bomper is like the god of periodization, but you know, his stuff is deep, man. It's it's like reading an old philosopher. And I, I got one of his books before I'd ever went to uni and I'm trying to sort of read it. It's very heavy stuff. And I would read the um, paragraphs over and over to try and comprehend it. And so I had a good idea of like the Eastern Bloc style of periodization. So I've gone down to Sydney. I've met up with um, a guy who was a coach with the Institute of Sport. And we got talking about development. And I said, oh, this is what I think, all this. And he said, mate, you sound like our East German coach. <laughs> and so um, he got me out there. And so straight up, the guy's like, yeah, come on, come and join my team. And we sort of, um, yeah, that, that sort of was the transition um, into sport, into, into more elite sport and work with, athletes for a number of years and and i guess i'm, I'm telling that side of the story purely because 
it was I was kind of forced into going to uni from there because everyone I was working with, they'd all had uni degrees and all that. And they were like, seriously, you're good at this, but you need that piece of paper. So I um, I ended up applying after being hassled for a number of years. And at 29, I did my exercise science degree at UTS. So um, from there, sort of, um, you know, after the 2000 Olympics, I decided to get more into health and it was after working on the biggest loser in 2006 i came across rapid weight loss and as you would know rapid weight loss had been given a bad rap for many years but when you looked at the research it was actually like the opposite it was that you know uh, the, one of the best predictors for achieving uh, your weight loss goals and keeping it off was actually the rate of weight loss over those first few months so i started looking more into that and playing around with that and i noticed that people started losing uh, their medications along the way as well as as their health improved. But Australia wasn't ready for that back then. So um, I'd set up a clinic and um, I kept studying. I did a, a, master's, in educa a master's in education with PDHPE uh, whilst I was going along. And uh, then um, started. I set up a Medicare-based clinic to show that it could be done within our, our current model because I knew the government wasn't going to change the model without proof. So I started doing that and uh, sort of went under the radar a bit and started going to international conferences like the International Congress on Obesity and uh, the European Congress on Obesity every year. So that was self-funded and it cost me between seven and 10 grand a year for each conference to go to. But I just wanted to be around all the, the big thinkers, all the people, and so I could pick their brains. Um, and then sort of, yeah, 2016, started my master's in research and now doing a PhD in this area. So um it's it's been a, a wild ride <laughs> it certainly has and when did you sort of start to get in, interested in diabetes in particular uh well look it, it's always been around my community so um yeah my grandmother had it my step my stepfather had it and we reversed his by the way just <laughs> but um you know it was always there and so i guess the main thing was when i started getting people to lose weight and they started dropping medication and the surprise on the GP's faces was like, wait up, there might be something here. And so I rang some of my sort of friends who were sort of been around the industry a little longer, especially around sort of nutrition and things like that. I said, is this normal? Like this, this is actually too good to be true. Like maybe I just don't understand it because what I was doing was kind of, it wasn't totally against what was uh, being said, but it was very different and it was certainly on the border. <laughs> you know, it could be seen as a fringe kind of thing um, but so with outcomes, they were a fringe thing too, you know. So I, I think that it was just seeing what was happening time and time and time again. And you just can't, you, you know, you, saw, you can't unsee it. And basically when you say your outcomes, I mean, uh, you're really talking about a combination of, of diet and exercise? Yeah, absolutely. So, well, you know, it's, it's the mental side of things as well, but definitely um, – you know, the we, we know that uh, the impact that food has on uh, like the, what, what you put in your mouth is, is going to determine what your sugars are and what your medications are going to be as well, you know, or how much medication you're going to be uh, taking. And the same with exercise, you know, it has a blunting effect and, you know, it, it's going to have an impact on your metabolism as well. So we, we sort of worked out a format that would work within primary care around that and like people just reduce medication, yeah. You mentioned about uh, your community, the Indigenous community, and, and they have incredibly high rates of, uh, of type 2 diabetes and, and obesity. Um, to give us your thoughts on, on why you think that's the case and and, uh, and how you intend to tackle it. Yeah, look, there's no doubt there's sort of ongoing um, colonisation issues too. Like that, that a lot of people that don't get in communities wouldn't understand that, but it, it's there. There's racism in health and so on. And, you know, but, but even without that, um, it's about um, carrying you know, body fat around the organs at a lower uh, BMI. So if we've got sort of, um, you know, we, we've got one, one fella who's 25 years of age and as you, and another fella who's 25 years of age, one's Indigenous, one's non-Indigenous, and they put on 10 kilos, which is easier to do at 25 years of age, um, you know, where it gets stored will be very different uh, depending on genetics. And, and if you're Aboriginal, it's more likely to be going around those organs. And that's gonna start that process uh, towards type two diabetes. Now, some people, you know, it'll take more than that and some people won't ever get it, but uh, people that are predisposed, which is 
you know, people from the Asian community and, and Aboriginal people and so on, it's going to happen at a lower BMI usually. And does the Indigenous community, I mean, they're obviously very aware that this is an issue and uh, they've been trying to uh, to address it. I mean, have they come to you for, for help? <laughs> Not really. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. Um, I, I work within the AMS system, so the Aboriginal Medical Service System. So we, we've definitely had uh, some communities reach out and, that, and that's how we usually move around these days is through word of mouth. But organisations that are really taking care of um, funding and things like that, no, no, and, and they should be, they should be. There's nothing else there. So. And do you find the results in the Indigenous community are, are just as good as in the, uh, in the, in the non-Indigenous Australian community? Mate, I would put any of my locations up against pretty much any program in Sydney. <laughs> so the, the outcomes we get are far superior uh, to what you'd usually see. So there might be some good programs around, but overall, like to give you an idea, we've got a program in Canamble right now at the AMS. So this is run by the practice nurse and an Aboriginal health worker who have zero experience in running programs, running lifestyle programs, but plenty of experience in being a nurse, of course, 30 odd years. And um, over the last 11 months, they've got their patients, they've gone from big issues to having their patients lose 1.4 tonne across 11 months, so 1,417 kilos. So I don't have the current stats for numbers, but when it was at 983 kilos uh, lost, that was for 110 people, which worked out about eight or nine kilos each or something it was. Amazing. Which is good. Yeah. It's good. For um, medical sense, it's bloody good. Fantastic. Now, um, so let's uh, let's talk about your research. Um, you said you're doing a PhD. What, what are you trying to achieve with your research? Yeah, just looking at uh, the factors that sort of provide success with with uh, reversal of type two diabetes in Aboriginal communities. Um, there's certainly a number of factors, and we'll run a, we'll run a lifestyle intervention with that. It's qualitative work as well, so we're interviewing some people who uh, have had success, and then we'll interview people before they do the intervention and after, and then compare it to a control as well. Um, so you know. It's, um, you know, we'll see where it goes, but, you know, we, we've seen um, what can happen uh, within uh, communities when they have control, when they uh, have clear information on what, what they can do, as well as, you know, their GPs understand how to uh, de-prescribe medication, which is, you know, a, an obstacle as well at times. But, yeah, no, look, it's exciting. I'm also involved in some other big research out of Melbourne University um, which is the FLASH uh, study, FLASH GM study. And what they're looking at is the use of FLASH, uh, flash uh, glucose monitors for people on injectable medications for type 2 diabetes and just seeing if that has an impact. And I think, like, from what I've seen in practice, that feedback, that instant feedback from what you eat and exercise is very educational. So, yeah, we'll see how we go. Absolutely. So what... Um... If, uh, if if I came to you and, and said, you know, and I was clearly overweight and, and I just uh, developed type, type 2, di been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, what are the sort of general dietary advice that you would be giving me? Yeah, well, through the medical centres, what they do, we train them up on it. And they um, obviously they're going to be reducing carbohydrates because a lot of people that are advancing, like a lot of people we get, their HbA1c's are well over seven. They're on, you know, a range of medications, of course. So we know that uh, they're, they're being prescribed that medication because of their current lifestyle. So when we adjust that lifestyle by reducing carbohydrate intake, by improving exercise, and, and with that, that's just walking. We start people with walking and build from there. So the idea is try to remove as many obstacles as possible, uh, simple foods that are easy accessible. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's, it works well with um, historically with Aboriginal communities. So the first ever um, report on Indigenous health was done in 1979. So they, they sort of got the data together in 77. report was released in 79. And, and what it showed was uh, Aboriginal people who lived out of town, who lived more traditionally, it, like type 2 diabetes was virtually non-existent. So it was higher in the non-Indigenous community. But when they moved into town uh, with the more processed food and, and more carbohydrates and all those sorts of things, and, and so like everyone... Because everyone says, oh, they just can't handle the Western food. No one can handle Western food. <laughs> you know, that's the whole problem with with Australia's uh, diabetes rate at the moment. The problem is, is 
if they put on five kilos, that's going to take them closer to type two diabetes just genetically. So it's um, it's more aligned. And I, I do laugh when people say, oh, you know, we don't know the long term uh, outcomes from uh, low carb diets. And you sort of look, well, how's 80,000 years? You know, like it is, like it, it's well documented across a number of studies. Uh, average intake was like 65 percent. Uh, animal products uh, and, and look there's different nations all over Australia so it would have varied depending on inland and seaside and all that sort of stuff but you know 65 percent animal products low rates of diabetes low rates of heart disease so right one of the frustrations that uh, that many of us have is with my profession the medical profession um, what's your you know response from the uh, from the GPS to, to your uh, your program? And how do you go about, uh, you know, tackling sort of uh, GPs who are sceptic or reluctant or, or don't want to have anything to do with your program? Yeah, mate, look, in, in honesty, the majority, like, it's rare that a GP doesn't get on board because, like, they, where we go, there's, like, we, we go to really tough locations, really um, challenging locations. So if you come out there and you can show, you show the research and then you tell them how you're going to do it, well, they know that like lifestyle is the first line of treatment. Like that's common knowledge through uh, medical training, but the outcome seems so outrageous. <laughs> but so they get on board. But we will get some sometimes. It'll be like, oh no, no, you can't go sort of uh, reducing medications, or they might sort of reduce uh, patients' insulin by only two units at a time when they should be dropping them at ten units at a time. So yeah, so we've got to feed people up so that they stay safe. But in general, look. I guess I learned uh, a number of years ago that you can argue research, you can argue you know, theories and ideologies, but you can't argue with res with results. And so that's what I've been focused on for the last 10 years is just keep showing no matter where I go, we just keep showing the results and you just can't argue with that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Full credit to you. Um, you know, your, your program is, is very similar to our Defeat Diabetes program. I mean, it's basically the same principles it's uh, it's you know restricting carbohydrate intake, uh, restricting processed foods, and going back to, yeah, to eating the way that uh, you know our ancestors uh, used to eat with uh, with real food. Yeah, no, absolutely, and look, and I guess that's what got me because, like I said, I, I don't come from uh, intellectual stock, you know, like, um, and, and that's why, like, when when I started really thinking about it, I was like, I can't be right, like, you know, that seems too obvious. And the more I read up on it, the more I realised that it just had been done so many times before. And and it was uh, Karen O'Day's work that really got me going, no, wait up. Like, this is someone who really knew what they were doing, knew the academic world, and was able to show this in seven weeks. Well, this is what we're seeing. We're seeing exactly exactly what she's saying here, you know, so many years on. Um, so, you know, it's always been there. It's always been there, this information. But I think that the problem's been, look, a lot, a lot of people want to lay blame on various things, but I honestly believe that it's more along the lines of um, we've never worked out a way of implementing lifestyle change through primary care, which is pretty important. Uh, the referral pathways we have, everyone works in silos. And because, the outcome, because of this, the outcomes are poor. And, and obviously, and also because there's been very limitations on what uh, dietary advice can be provided. Uh, and we even know now, like people are still getting, with diabetes are getting referred to the dietary guidelines, which it's just not designed for them. And, and it's written on there that it's not designed for them. So, you know, it, it's a combination of things. And in the end, people get poor results. So when people get poor results, then it's easy to blame the patient. And if you blame the patient, you never, ever have to be accountable and you never have to think about what you're doing wrong. And I know you've got a sporting background. Uh, you see my belt up there. I've trained a few fighters and stuff. And let me tell you, you don't win that much. You don't learn that much after wins. You learn after losses. You get very reflective when you get your butt kicked. And this is what should be happening with the health profession. And, and don't get me wrong. We've got amazing health workers, but our outcomes are nowhere near what the research shows. So that tells us that we've got, that we've got to be part of the problem. And so we've got to look at ourselves and what we're doing. And if we're not seeing these sort of results that you've seen on the show and so on, you might be doing something wrong. <laughs> exactly. That's what I always say. I mean, if you're, a, if you're running a company, a business, and your uh, you're, you know, bottom line every year got worse and worse for 30 years, 
sometime in that 30 years, maybe sometime you might actually say, oh, maybe we need to do something different. Maybe we're doing something wrong. And that's exactly what's happened with, uh, with diet. And yet we continue to make the same mistakes every year and we get fatter and sicker. It's just incomprehensible, really. But anyway, we won't solve all that uh, in one hour. I want to talk about Michael Mosley because uh, it's a fascinating character um, who's obviously had a massive impact. I mean, he's pivoted a little bit with his dietary uh, you know, interventions over the years. He's gone 5-2 and, and this and that and so on. But the principles are always the same. Tell us how you got involved with, uh, with Michael. Yeah, I just on that point, I will say that I, I discuss those sort of things and, and you can see that there's a real evolution with what he's doing. So he's sort of evolving over time as he learns, he sort of adapts. And so that's how that's come about. But yeah, look, it, it was interesting because like I said, I've just been focused on outcomes. I, 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 The reason why I was in the remote communities was 2016, I just got so frustrated. I was at, at the start of 2017, I was just so over the health industry and the government departments not listening. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to focus on Aboriginal health because I was working in both. And I decided to go to the NACHO conference. So that's the Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation, one where that looks after all the medical centres run by communities. So there's over 300 around the country. And so I told them what I did and I showed them some of the results and they, they gave me a good speaking spot. So I got up there and I told them what I've been doing. And, and I said to the CEOs, I said, I want three locations uh, I want the, the, the more challenging, the better, because I want to show what can be done. I want to show, I, I promise you, we will improve things. And I had uh, Barbara Flick from Burke put her hand up and Christine Corby from Bree and, and uh, Walgett. So we had the three locations, um, all challenging locations, but beautiful locations. And um, yeah, so for 18 months, I traveled out, out there for every fortnight, every two weeks. I drove out there, it was about 3,000 kilometer round trip. And um we, we, we got good outcomes. And so um, the production company had heard about the program and, and Michael heard because David Unwin over in the UK as well had sort of been showing it around. And so it was really, really good that it had, it had shown just by putting my head down. So they contacted me and I think I was going to get like a five minute spot. They were just sort of, can Michael come and follow you around and, and show what's about, what's out there? Said, yeah, yeah, that's good. But we had a few Zoom uh, meetings and I spoke about the research and obviously I'm doing a PhD on it around the research and I um, was speaking about the outcomes and they were just like, man, like you represent everything we're trying to show. Would you be keen to co-host? And I'm like, yeah, I'm there, I'm there. <laughs> so, so and, and that's how it worked. And I sort of met up with Michael. We did a screen test. And because we sort of know the same researchers and can't follow the same sort of formats, um, yeah, it was pretty simple. All right. And, uh, and how long did it take you to sort of put all that together? I mean, were, were you, was Michael out uh, in Australia for a lengthy period of time and uh, hung out with you guys? Yeah, I tell you, we, uh, we were supposed to start filming March last year and about two days before uh, he was flying or a day before he was flying, uh, COVID was shutting everything down. So it was like the 16th or 17th of March. Is a pretty... <laughs> so I'm packing. I'm ready to go for a few months and travel like around Australia. So the show was going to be all over Australia and we'd had people picked out for it. So the production company picks out the people. So they had them all over the country anyway. So all of a sudden, okay, look, we're going to put off six months. Let's see how it goes. So it ended up coming about six months later and uh, Michael and his wife came over, must've been for about eight or nine weeks. And so I went into quarantine a week before them uh, and sort of over in Fremantle and uh, so I started, I kicked it off because I was running the lifestyle intervention on the show with the pa patients. So putting them through their meal plan and their exercise program and everything. And um, so after seven days, Michael got out and then we sort of traveled around for a few weeks. And yeah, it was great. Good, good taking him out bush. It just was hot. It was hot for me being an Aussie, but I don't know how I'd feel being uh, an English guy coming over from winter <laughs> into 48 degree Roburn heat. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, and you had some indigenous uh, patients on the on the program, and uh, and they they did incredibly well. Yeah, that no, was good. Look, I, I guess what I liked about the show was it was pretty diverse, and I I actually said to the uh, production company that I wanted some advanced cases. I wanted people who had been on yeah you know, been on medication for many years. I didn't want the low hanging fruit of pre diabetes, and within six years, yeah, you know, the normal direct stuff you're seeing replicated around, which is great, but we've done that. Let, let, let's show with the more complex cases. Um, I just said it's too good a platform, too big a platform not to show what's possible. And that's how people like Robert and Marion and so on 
came into play. But there's so many stories behind each of them, you know, um, just health conditions behind the scenes that we're working with and that as well. But now, look, it was great um, work, working with uh, people from the communities. Always wonderful because, you know, they're going to inspire more people around them and all their family. And that's that's exactly what happens. Yeah. Uh, I guess those people are now big stars in their own communities, and uh, yeah. and and hopefully will have a have an impact on their uh, on their fellow travellers. Yeah, that's how it works. That's how it works. <laughs> yeah, that's great. One of the interesting things was obviously there was lots of weight loss, you know, which is you can see, and they jumped on the scales regularly, and uh, and their diabetes glucose control improved. But uh, there are other conditions, you know, like blood pressure and so on, that uh, that seem to have a massive impact. Yeah, uh, yeah. Look, it always does. Like we. We we co when with our program we coach people from day one on what um, low blood pressure is about because like people are, are medicated to their current lifestyle you change their lifestyle they're going to need uh, medication reviews so um, some yeah you know, we, we can see people you know dropping medication for blood pressure in seven to fourteen days but yeah you know, we, we get some people with really high blood pressure at the start so if we can just get them into the safe range during a, a, a 10 week program where we've, we've earned our money, you know, so, but then they do, they do, they, they usually do. So majority, I think it's like 92%. I've done the stats before. So it's, um, it's pretty good, but yeah, look, it's, it's so many different conditions, you know, but it's even like back pain, it's migraines. It's uh, so many things that go along with a change of lifestyle that doesn't get discussed. And obviously mental health as well. Yep. So, um, are you going to continue to keep in touch with the uh, the people you? Because uh, obviously that's one of the issues. I mean, people say, okay, you know, you can lose weight for you know, your eight week program or, or whatever it is, you know. But the but then they always revert back. You know, what what's yeah. your uh, yeah. answer to that? Yeah, no, and and they can. And to, to tell you the truth, we uh, with my programs, we teach people from day one that your weight's going to fluctuate, and this is what you do when it does. So we we know since the dawn of time that. Um, people's weight go up and down, you know, so yeah, we, we teach them with that, but yeah, um, it's been a, about a year now since we filmed. So probably a week under a year. So um, I'm still in touch with them. They're going great guns, you know, um, Charlie's still off all his medication and he's vigilant, man. He's so easy to work with. He just, he, he just wanted help. And when he saw that he could do it, he was just like a bullet at a gate. He did everything. Uh, Robert's still off insulin, HBO one Steve's still going good. Uh, there's a few of them that have had some unrelated surgeries, you know, like different things that happen as people get older and all sorts of things. But mm. overall, yeah, they're all thriving. They're going well. Yeah, people always say, uh, you know, people lose motivation. Uh, to, but but to me, uh, I mean, the greatest motivation is is that, you know, you see the results. And, and that's that to me is enough motivation. You, you can see what, uh, you know, A, what the numbers are doing, you know, your blood pressure or your uh, HbA1c, but also how you feel. And, uh, and so on. Mm. And that I always think that's the greatest way of motivating people. They don't need any extra motivation because they're just feeling so good. I think yeah. I never want to go back to that uh, that old way. That's it. And I think uh, like there's a couple of uh, things that are really important. Like people need to lose that stigma of um, putting on weight being a failure. Like it's, it, it happens. So, you yeah, know, just, just rip it back in, you know, like uh, don't let it go too far and rip it back in. But also the support, like it's, it's so critical to have that support like you know there, there's people who would sign up to health programs that they know what they need to do but they need that accountability and support that's that's what they need you know and and i'm talking health professionals as well you know so it, it's so critical and i don't think it's uh mentioned enough uh through our care system um and obviously you know like i mean it's a funding thing for uh primary care yeah you know, you've only got so much time you know so much um, allocated hours that you can work with people but it's something that needs to improve if they're serious about uh, improving chronic disease. Yep. And uh, and the role of ongoing exercise, I mean, I, I always sort of feel, my, my theory is a little bit that uh, to lose weight, it's mainly diet, but to maintain the weight loss, a lot of it is exercise. Um, yeah. and people say, oh, you've got to exercise to lose weight. Well, I, I have a bit of a different slant on it. I think you've actually got to lose weight to exercise because once you yeah. start losing weight, you know, you feel better you're able to exercise and you, you enjoy the exercise a lot more it's not not much fun exercising when you're grossly overweight and, and unwell it hurts <laughs> yeah no look yeah and, and you're right there like the if you're exercising to burn calories for weight loss you're going to be disappointed you know that's yeah. not what it's about what where we incorporate exercise is more along the lines of uh improving metabolic rate 
uh, improving muscle mass, improving mobility, improving fitness, those sort of foundational. That's why we start people with walking. And, and Kerry from the show is probably a prime example. So she could only take, like she, she's 160 odd kilos, um, you know, really low independence. So, so she's, she, she can take about three steps on her own. So she walks with a frame. She uses a, a gopher to get around town. Um, does a housework on a computer chair, like on a computer chair on wheels. So for us to just get stuck into her, we could have just given her shakes and um, made her lose weight and HBO and C drops, and we look great on TV. But as soon as we go, she's she's stuffed. It all comes back on. So our first point, as far as exercise goes, has to be mobility. It has to be because without mobility, she has no independence. Without independence, she loses confidence. Um, you know, she loses control. So that's why, like, we started with, you know, sit to stand, walking to the door and back, which is only a few steps, but doing that and so slowly improving that uh, foundational work that's going to improve her sugars long term. Yep. Well, that's uh, it was a great show. I must admit, you know, I uh, obviously I'm, I'm biased, but I, I thought it was a really, uh, really well done. Um, you know, you, you're absolutely right. You didn't pick easy targets. I mean, you picked some really challenging uh, cases, um, both, uh, you know, from a health point of view and a weight point of view. Um, and really, you didn't really have any anyone who didn't significantly improve their, uh, their health. One of the interesting things I thought was that almost every one of them fell off the, you know, fell off the wagon at some stage over that eight weeks. So they all had a day or they had a birthday or they had a, you know, something, uh, uh, they fell a bit down, so they they would back their comfort eating for a day or so. But you managed to get all of them back on track. What was the? What do you think is the secret yeah. of? Well, of we, that? we tell people all the time when they're down. Was I'll say like, yo, I've I've had some amazing outcomes, some like transformations people wouldn't believe. But I can tell you one thing they all had in common: they slipped up. They slipped up. But but the but the other thing they had in common is that they got up back on track fast. So, you know, you, you, you've got to get back onto it. So it's okay to have a slip up of a meal or a day. You just can't have it turn into two, three days, a week, a month, uh, so on like that. That's how weight gain occurs. So it's about teaching people to get back on, like to dust yourself off. Obviously, you don't want too many of those days, but just get back on track as fast as you can. One of the interesting things, and one of our, uh, of our viewers has mentioned it too, uh, Mary, talking about, improvement in mental health in some of the uh some of the, the people on the show and that's something that i think we all see a lot of and something that's grossly underrated i mean the management of mental health in our community is is poor um and medications are relatively ineffective uh, and yet diet and lifestyle is uh, just as effective if not more so has been shown by research to be more so than uh, than the medications and yet you know the first step that everyone has when they go and see a doctor is that uh, they get a prescription yeah, no, it's true. And, you know, one of my favorite parts of running a program, when we do a program launch, I've got everyone in front of me and I'm presenting and I just love looking at them. But like inside, I'm just glowing. I'm smiling because I'm thinking all of these people, they can hardly look me in the eye and I'm here telling them this is what we can achieve and this is what you might be able to do. And I know inside they're going, yeah, look, if I can get half of that, that would be good. Or, you know, if, you know, like that might happen for other people, but you don't know me, you don't know what's going on in my life. And then within yep. two or three weeks, their shoulders are back. They're looking you in the eye. They're high-fiving you. They're just changed so much, so, so much. And it doesn't take long. And it's that confidence that comes from that, that control, getting that control back and, and feeling better, better sleep, all those sorts of things that tie in with improving your lifestyle. Yeah, great. Okay, look, there's a ton of questions and comments here. Let me uh, let me go through some of them. Uh, Ray, you're a great role model. Um would love to be off meds, but the doctor doesn't seem to support that. Uh, thanks for the message. So important for the communities. Great broadcast. Can blood pressure be reversed? Well, I think you know you showed that with a number yeah. of the of the patients on the on the show. I mean, I think you know, and yet you know, we are never taught as doctors that diet can have an effect on uh, on blood pressure. Maybe hear a little bit about salt, which is probably not that important anyway. Um, mm -hmm. And yet, you know, it can be so effective in blood pressure. Yeah, I, I think it's probably easier to reverse blood pressure than what it is for diabetes, to be honest. Yep, yep, good point. Um, okay, do you find exercise is necessary to shift stubborn belly fat? I've lost a lot of weight without exercise, but still a lot of fat in midriff. Yeah, well, you know, it, it just comes with uh, where you're storing it. So 
you know, you just need to lose more weight and that that's some people just lose it last off the off the belly you know so um there's no specific exercise uh but you know just keep pushing through if you want to get lower but i mean where you want to sit with your weight like you can be overweight and healthy you know if you've got no diabetes or blood pressure anything like no metabolic disease it doesn't matter what weight you're at but if it comes down to how you're storing fat and you're not happy just yeah keep going with it uh lynn suggests that every diabetic should wear a cgm a continuous glucose monitor information is so valuable and helps with learning about your own body and how it works and i think uh, i certainly agree i i've you know i'm not diabetic but i've worn a cgm a few times and and mm-hmm. very you know educational and, and there's nothing more you know more motivating to see what effect you know a breakfast cereal or, or something has uh, on your blood sugar and to see that result you know in front of you on your on your phone uh, is quite motivating yeah, absolutely. I've done the same. And I've eaten sort of some some lolly snakes and I've had a beer and I've gone for a walk and I've gone for a run and I've done all I've, I've played around with it in so many different ways. They're, they're great little toys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Pauline says, great to hear the GPs are listening. Wish it was more like that in inner city. Uh, I think that's, that's a fair comment. Mary says, I was impressed with the bravery of the participants in the show. I think that's absolutely right. It's very brave to go on TV and be weighed, exercise, etc. It's fantastic to see the gains most of them uh, most of them made. I mean, uh, you know, some of them must have approached it with some trepidation. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Like, Robert, like, you, you look at cases like Robert, like, you know, people who have been around chronic disease a lot would pick this up, but he's advanced, right? He's advanced. So he, he's got his eyes are deteriorating. He's getting injections in his eyes. Now, we, we drop his blood sugars too fast. We could screw his whole eyesight for the rest of his life, you know, like – there's heart issues in there. There's so many different things. And then like you look at Kerry with mobility, I'm trying to get her walking around the house more. If she falls over, no one in her house can pick her up. Like she's calling for an ambulance. You know what I mean? Like it, it, that's scary like and embarrassing. And, and we discussed all that sort of stuff. So yeah, we, we came up with some things to, to work, work around with that. But man, there, there was, there was some yeah, people there, Lynn, 250 units of insulin a day. Like, you know, like we've got some yeah, cases. I've never, never, I've never heard of that. 250 oh, years. Crazy. And, and it was required. Like it wasn't like the GP hadn't tried. She was a very progressive GP, yeah. a great GP. Um, but, you know, like these people were really putting their hands up. They really wanted help because they knew where it was going to go and no one wants to go on TV but, like that. But that, to their credit, they did. Mm, absolutely. Um, another question. Do you have a problem with loss of motivation? I guess there's a certain percentage that drop out and we've sort of addressed that. But uh, what, what other tricks do you have up your sleeve to, to, uh, to motivate people, uh, Ray? Oh, look, you know, there's, there's a range of things, uh, reasons why people might drop out. Um, sometimes they're things that you have no control of, like, uh, you know, immediate family deaths and uh, health conditions that take over. Um, things like that. But, but in general, it's not a high drop out rate. So I guess how we work with it is we try to get really good results in the first seven days. So if you follow what we say, you're going to you're gonna see really good results on your blood pressure and blood sugars within seven days, or within three or four days, you know. So, you know, it doesn't take long to for people to go, okay, this might be fair income. And if, and if they are ready and they follow the advice, they're usually going to lose anywhere between two and five, six kilos in the first week anyway. So, you know, it's it's easy to get that motivation if you can get them for seven days. If you get them for seven days, it's not too bad. Yep. But yeah, but but, but let me add one other thing to that. Uh, in addition, when you get those good fast results after a few weeks, people can become complacent. So they're getting the pats on the back from their friends and their partners. Oh, you're looking great. You're doing so well. And so they start cutting corners. They stop doing what actually works. And so we try to alert people that that can happen and some people still fall into the trap and so that can make make them lose motivation because they feel like they're doing everything the same still but they're obviously not and once you work out what the issue is they're back on track ideally how often would you want to see someone who is on a, on a weight loss program like this for those very reasons yeah oh, once a week yeah once a week, once a week. i think p- p- most people can get through one weekend a lot of people can't get through two <laughs> without yeah. accountability like because it's all about momentum so uh, that's mainly in those first four to five weeks so i've actually run programs at locations where we do once a week and others where we've done once a fortnight and, and there's a remarkable difference between the two right 
Interesting. Uh, <clears throat> Amy's got a good question. Is it harder to reverse diabetes the longer someone has had it? Yes. Uh, but, but that said, it's definitely more difficult only because of the damage to the beta cells. But we still see, and, and look, I guess it depends on whether we're talking about remission. If we're talking about remission, like getting off all medication, definitely harder. Uh, if we're talking about re uh, reducing medications and improving HbA1c, it's not a big difference. It's not as big a difference. So we, we get lots of people that come in with HbA1c's between 10, 13, 14. So to, to have a HbA1c around that, your sugars are sitting pretty high during the day because, you know, it's balanced out with the nighttime there. Um, but, you know, they, they'll get, you know, under seven, you know, within the 10 weeks. Like that, that's usually what will happen. Um, Nick has an interesting question. If a GP wants to get involved, but will struggle with the time to coach behaviour changes, where do they go to to enlist uh, health health professionals that understand low carb and behaviour change and so on? <laughs> so, that's always a challenging well, question. No, but th this is what was so important about that recent position statement that came out by Diabetes Australia, because one of our obstacles is, you know, like I said, the research is there. We get the outcomes. We all know what's possible, but not all nurses and allied health and that have seen that. And so they're still going by the old method of how they were trained, which was very, very recent. Uh, but with this Diabetes Australia position statement, they can now be guided. They can say, okay, well, this is what they're saying. And it actually matches what Diabetes Australia is saying. So maybe I should be looking at what other methods. So I think we're going to see a big shift, which, which is, as you know, has been coming for a while, but that, that's a, a, going to be a critical point. Uh, for change now gps i feel for them like seriously like when when i start working with one that's really switched on they can't believe it they're like yes i'll, I'll refer every patient i've got to you that can like they, they, they're looking for stuff like this uh but they don't always have um people to refer to so it makes it tough but you know we, we work with it we have an app and everything that sort of coaches people through and all that sort of stuff so but it's it's tough you know like for a GP, like they get blamed for putting people on more and more medication, but without lifestyle change, what else do you do? Like there's really, that that's all they've got. Their hands are tied with that. So it's about, I think that we've got to stop funding programs that don't work. Okay. It's, that's, there's too much of that. And we've got to make health professionals more accountable for their outcomes. And that's not to, to hang it on uh, health professionals. It's to raise the bar and just say, okay, look, this is what we expect. So we, if we're going to refer to you, this is the standard we expect out of X out of every 100 patients. Yeah, and look, I guess that was my motivation for, for starting the Defeat Diabetes Program because basically you know, I kept waiting for some organisation or someone who should have you know, come out with something and, and nothing happened. And uh, and people desperately need you know, need that information. So uh, that's there. There are practitioners around. Um, yeah. There's a good list of practitioners on the Low Carb Down Under website. Uh, so dietitians, doctors, uh, health coaches, exercise physiologists who uh, will support low carb programs. So uh, that's worth looking at. It's a good way of finding people. Uh, they've got Got people in every state, so uh, that's useful. Um, a comment sa says that mainstream doctors voluntarily demotivate you the moment you say you want to try diet over drugs. They're the ones who say it's unsustainable, doesn't work well, and so on. And yeah. that's absolutely true. You will see that. And and clinical inertia. So two of the things I talk on is uh, fatalism, diabetes fatalism. So just that expectation that it's going to happen and it's going to be bad and clinical inertia so there's clinical inertia that can occur um you know mindfully where people are just like ah like that but there's also ways that they do it like they, they they're caring for you but they thought oh no she's not going to be able to do it so i won't i won't bring it up i won't bring that program up because she won't feel good when she fails and all this sort of stuff so you don't get an opportunity um and and that's a real issue a lot of it is just ignorance. I mean, uh, you know, in, in my you know six years of medical degree, I didn't have a single lecture on, on nutrition. Now, that was a few years ago, but I don't think things have changed uh, changed that much. And so, you know, as doctors, I mean, and we're all the same. We all stay in our comfort zone. And for doctors, their comfort zone is medications and surgery and things like that. Whereas, you know, nutrition and, and exercise is way out of their comfort zone. They've never, you know, been been taught anything. So naturally, you you know, you steer away from that steer clear of it and uh and i think the other you know we talk a lot about uh a low carb program giving hope to people with uh, with type 2 diabetes is one of david unwin's uh big things is you know giving giving hope but 
I think you're also giving hope to, to doctors, you know, hope, hope to practitioners because at the moment, you know, if you're a GP, you, you know, type 2 diabetes is one of the most common conditions you see and there's really nothing you can do for, for patients. And so you're giving doctors a tool that can actually put diabetes into remission and that, that's exciting for them because you, basically that's why you, I think, that's why you do medicine because you actually want to make people better and uh, you're giving someone the tool to do that and giving the doctor and the patient hope, which is really exciting. Yeah, that's right. I think, you know, one thing we've seen out of this show was that like, the amount of contact I've had from health professionals is that the industry's ready. Like, they're really ready. That They wouldn't have been ready five years ago, but they're really ready now. And uh, the timing, you know, with the show and everything, uh, Diabetes Australia with their position statement and all these sort of things coming together, I, I think... You know, th things that oh, well, I know things are going to change anyway. We know that because we're not going to stop pushing. But you know, I, I think that the industry as a whole will start looking at itself. Yeah, look, we're really out of time, right? Uh, time's flying. But two two final questions. Firstly, from Francis, when you say low carb, can you have any carbs at all during the day, and when is the best time to have them? Well, for me, look, there's obviously a sliding scale for people. And, and I guess with my advice, I'm usually working with communities that are limited. Um, so we've got, to, we've got to be fairly fluid on what options are available. Uh, but hard and fast rule, just eliminate bread, rice and pasta until you can process them okay, you know, so getting things under control. So uh, eliminating those, um, you know, have your... Um, your salads, veggies, have have a couple of pieces of fruits if you need. That sort of stuff is fine. Uh, but, yeah, that, that's probably where we look at. But, like, we're trying to balance in cost, uh, ease of preparation, um, accessibility, because we work in a lot of remote communities. Right. And the last question, the low-carb eating plan seems to always say low-carb, high-fat. Can you clarify the high-fat as in healthy as opposed to just high? Yeah, that's right. It's usually just healthy fat these days is that no one's going to say high unhealthy fat but you know like just yeah you know your, your avocados and fish and stuff like that so great yeah. okay well i thought we'll finish with one last comment um from one of our listeners 18 months on lost 30 kilograms have come off all my hypertensive medications reverse diabetes normalized glucose and insulin levels not had a single pill for over a year for arthritic pain <laughs> says it all yeah, and, and it's no surprise, is it? Like it's um, it's the sort of thing that happens, anti-inflammatory, you know, uh, meal plan, you know, you're, um, you're probably moving better, sleeping better. Everything, everything improves uh, when you uh, change that lifestyle around and certainly uh, all those added um, complications that come with diabetes and high blood pressure. I mean, a, a lot of people say, you know, it's like a fog is lifted. And um, yeah, so, you know, it, it's great and, yeah, that's why we love the work, eh? It's good. Yeah, we do. It's very rewarding. People smile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're running out of time, Ray. Um, just want to say, firstly, congratulations on the show. I thought it was terrific. Um, your contribution was was great, and uh, along with Michael's. And, and hopefully, you know, it's had a big impact on, on people, as you have had yourself over, over the years. So, uh, you know, you should be enormously proud of what, uh, what you've achieved, uh, especially, you know, from where you've come from. Um, you know, it's, it's an amazing achievement and uh, I congratulate you and uh, and all I can say is keep up the good work and, you know, thank you. No, thanks, mate. You too. I know what you guys are pushing for and we're going in the same direction. So well done, mate. Okay. So that's it from uh, the Defeat Diabetes uh, live interview with uh, the media superstar, Ray Kelly. And uh, he was a nobody three weeks ago and now he's everywhere. So, uh, Ray, thank you very much for your time and uh, we look forward to the next interview in a couple of weeks. Thanks, Ray. Cheers.